Welcome back grade 12s. We are going to continue to go through the 2017 Northwest Prelim paper. That is your paper 1. We are going to continue from 1.2 where we stopped uh, on Monday or Tuesday when we last went through the paper. So let's go through the biological terms. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. Right the term next to the question number on the answer book. Now remember with these questions that in the whole paper normally spelling as long as we can read what you are saying spelling is not going to count. Uh, but if it's words like uh, radial muscles as opposed to um, oh, sorry circular muscles as opposed to ciliary muscles then then there's going to be a problem. You can't mix up those two. You also can't mix up things like glycolis, uh, uh, glycogen and uh, glucagon. Then it's going to be wrong. But in 1.2, spelling is extremely important. The moment you spell wrong in 1.2, they will not accept the answer. Please realize that. So let's quickly go through the different... Uh, questions over here and I'm going to try and revise the topic as we go through it. 1.2.1 the enrichment of water by an inorganic nutrient such as fertilizers is called eutrophication. eutrophication. Now eutrophication ladies and gentlemen happens when there is uh, extra nutrients in the water like phosphate and it can also happen with thermal pollution when there's an increase in temperature of the water, then there's a certain animal or plant that starts to bloom and thrive on this extra nutrients, thrive on this extra temperature, and they, they completely take over uh, in such an amount that they actually then, uh, the other animals and plants in the water then don't get enough oxygen or don't get enough nutrients, and then the other plants and other animals in the water then start to suffer. That then means that they are going to die and that decreases biodiversity. So this is a human impact question. Remember human impact, big part of paper one. And it's a section that we did in grade 11 that you have to revise. We will not necessarily get a chance to go through it again. 1.2.2 The part containing blood vessels that transport waste and nutrients between the fetus and the placenta. That is the umbilical cord. That is the umbilical cord. A rapid automatic response to an external stimulus. That is the definition for a reflex arc. The reflex arc, that's the definition for a reflex arc. So reflex arc. Be careful how you spell this. It's not an arch, it's an arc. Reflex arc. Or uh, you can also say a reflex response. The phase in meiosis in which four cells are formed having half the chromosome complement of the original cell is, again, now you've got to be careful. This is meiosis, but please don't like it, make it sound like mitosis. Then you're not going to get the mark. It's meiosis. Why is it meiosis? Because it's four cells and it's got half the number of chromosomes. So that is reduction division, meiosis. The product, reproductive strategy whereby young birds are able to fend for themselves at birth, that's pre-cochial development. Pre-cochial development, pre, I told you they pre-develop, they before they born they develop so they pre-develop pre-cochial so they're already ready to defend for themselves when they are born and these are normally birds that nest on the ground that needs to fend for themselves very quickly after their birth because they're on the ground they're more vulnerable they're not up in a tree where they are being protected by the area where they are a part that receives a stimulus and converts it into an impulse so that is a receptor, receptor, so your eyes, your skin can be a receptor, your taste buds, um, so those are the receptors. 
protective membrane situated over the cornea of the eye, conjunctiva, conjunctiva, conjunctiva. And when you get conjunctivitis, this is the part that is um, infected. A mass of white fibers which connects the two hemispheres of the brain together. That's the corpus callosum, corpus callosum. Uh, so it connects your left and your right hand brain and some interesting studies uh, in one of the videos that I posted for you guys in which if there's a problem with the corpus callosum that your left and your right hand brain don't talk to, to one another very effectively. Um, so please go watch those videos and see what happens when your corpus callosum is not working. nervous system containing a sympathetic and parasympathetic se uh, section that is your autonomic nervous system that is the part of the nervous system that will, for example will control your breathing um, and those automatic things that you don't have to think about use of resources in such a way that they are available in for future generations is sustainability you sustain their use sustainability okay let's get to our a only b only both a and b and none questions remember that when you answer these questions and the answer is for example a only that you write a only you can't just write a then they're gonna mark it wrong it's got to be a only it's got to be b only it's got to be both A and B, or you, uh, it's got to be none. You can't just write A and expect them to give you the, the mark. If it's A only, you need to write A only. 1.3.1 allows for the passage of the ovum. The ovum. Urethra? No. The ovum never goes through the urethra. Okay, now there's not even a link in the woman uh, with regards to the urethra and her reproductive system. They are totally separate. It's not like in males where um, it's there's certain parts that overlap. Urethra, no. Both of these parts are part of the urinary system. And in the woman, the reproductive and the urinary system are totally separate. So the ovum never goes through any of these parts. So that is none the part of the peripheral nervous system part of the peripheral nervous system cranial nerves spinal nerves uh, okay so if we take a look at this this is both a and b is part of the peripheral nervous system then uh, what's then the the uh, the other part? What's opposed to the peripheral nervous system? So that's your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. But then the cranial nerves are the nerves that go from the brain to your senses, like your eyes and your your nose and your mouth and your uh, your uh, tongue and your ears. Those are your cranial nerves. And then the spinal nerves are the nerves that go out from the spinal cord to the rest of the body. Muscles that control the amount of light entering the eye. The amount of light. Now you got to be careful over here. Because this is opposing two things over here. It's opposing um, what we call uh, accommodation. Accommodation. And accommodation is what controls of uh, what we see when an object is either close to us or far from us, more than six meters away or closer than six meters away. And then we, it's opposing that to the pupillary reflex. You have to know uh, both of them very well. And when we talk about the ciliary muscles, ciliary and ciliary. Not circular, ciliary muscles. Ciliary muscles, that's to do with accommodation and how thick the lens is going to be. So to control uh, whether I can see objects that's close to me or far away from me. 
but in the case of pupillary reflex, we have the radial muscles of the iris and the circular muscles of the iris that controls pupillary reflex, not ciliary, circular muscles of the iris. And so B is the correct answer in this case. B only. Remember, you must write the only. B only. Affects growth and functioning of the heart and nervous system. Growth and functioning of the heart and the nervous system. And ladies and gentlemen, that is thyroxin. Thyroxin, it controls your metabolism. So how fast your heart is going to beat. Um, and how fast your nervous system will function. So that's thyroxin. And it's not testosterone. Testosterone has to do with the reproductive system. So it's A only. Then the last question on 1.3.5. Hormone causing the development of secondary sexual characteristics. And that's both A and B. In A, it's in the females, estrogen, and in B, it's in the males. But they both have an effect on the secondary sexual characteristics. But for estrogens, it's going to be on females. And for testosterone, it's going to be on the males. Let's go through 1.4. The diagram below represents a portion of the central nervous system of a human. It shows our cerebellum, it shows the cerebrum, it shows the medulla oblongata, and then the brain stem, which is uh, where uh, the brain is connecting into the spinal cord. Then, so you've got to know the function of each of these. Uh, so you've got to know the part, what is the part, and you've got to know what is the function. So then they ask, give the letter and the name. Now be careful with these questions. Sometimes I only ask the letter, sometimes I only ask the name. In this case, you have to give the letter and the name. When they ask you to give the letter, only give the letter. When they ask you to give the name, only give the name. And when they ask you to give the letter and the name, please give the letter and the name. If you leave one of them out, you're going to lose half the marks. So the letter and the name of the part responsible for each of the following. Regulation of breathing happens through the medulla oblongata, which is C. Medulla oblongata, which is C. Medulla oblongata. The origin of voluntary actions. So anything that's voluntary and your higher thinking, ladies and gentlemen, is your cerebrum. And our cerebrum as humans are very big. It's the biggest part of the brain because we have a lot of higher order thinking functions. So that's A, the cerebrum. And then maintain a balance and equilibrium. Uh, that is your cerebellum. Cerebellum. So cerebellum, not cerebrum, cerebellum. And that's D. It sits at the bottom. And what we find with animals that have more instinct and less higher order thinking they tend to have a higher, um, a bigger cerebellum and a smaller cerebrum, but we contain a lot more cerebrum and less cerebellum. So we don't have a lot of instincts as humans because our cerebellum is a lot smaller, but we have more higher order thinking. That's why we have a big cerebrum. But uh, the question asks, maintaining our balance and equilibrium is done by the cerebellum, which is the cerebellum. The diagram below represents the location of two endocrine glands. So if it's in the next, if it's around that uh, Adam's apple area, what we have there is your thyroid gland. Thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland, um, it's easy to remember what it excretes because it sounds a lot uh, similar. It's thigh, thyroid, thigh. Thyroxin, thyroxin, it secretes thyroxin, and thyroxin controls your metabolism. How fast is your metabolism? As a, uh, then we have the uh, the what controls the thyroid gland is your your what we call the main gland, and the main gland is called the pituitary gland, pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland, we also refer to that as the hypo 
thesis. Please don't confuse this with hypothalamus. It is not hypothalamus. Hypothalamus sits a bit higher up. It sits a bit higher up than the hypothesis. So please don't confuse that with the hypothalamus that sits a bit higher up and it's in close contact with the hypothesis or pituitary gland. And please, but please be careful of those two because they sound so similar. Identify glands A and B. So we said gland A, ladies and gentlemen, was the pituitary gland or hypothesis. Uh, and they going to they going to uh, sorry um, uh, hypothesis with a Y. Um, and then the thyroid gland. That's your thyroid gland. B is your thyroid gland. Negative feedback regulates the levels of hormones secreted by the glands mentioned in 1.5.1. Identify hormones 1 and 2. So it's thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroxin. And then hormone 2, um, hormone 1 tells, hormone, uh, tells gland B to secrete thyroxin. And then thyroxin will in turn tell TSH, please don't secrete, please don't, I, I'm doing my job, don't, I'm, I'm secreting thyroxin, you don't have to tell me to secrete more thyroxin. So it inhibits TSH and that's why we call it a negative feedback loop, negative feedback loop. Okay, let's start with question two, grade 12. Please note that I'm not going to do question 2.1 because we haven't discussed plant hormones as yet. We will discuss plant hormones later. We're going to start with question 2.2. Some animals uh, share the same reproductive strategy. Explain two adaptations of the amniotic egg for reproduction. So I'm going to pull up a diagram of the amniotic egg to show you uh, what we are talking about. Firstly, there's a shell for protection. Oh, sorry, let me just see the right document here. There we go. Okay, so there's a shell for protection. Uh, protection from both mechanical as well as dehydration. They may also use the word desiccation, which just means drying out. Then there's yolk and albumin, yolk and albumin for feeding. And now you've got your two moles. You only need to mention that. But if you want to continue, um, and if, you, if it counts more moles, you can mention some more things. Or you can mention any of the other things, just notice that with a question like this, they will only mark the first two marks, first two points. So if any one of those points are wrong, they're only going to mark the first two points and they're not going to move on to the rest of the question. So make sure that you, you whatever you know the best is what you, you write down first. Then... There's also amniotic fluid, so if we take a look at the amniotic fluid uh, surrounding here, the amniotic fluid that maintains a suitable, helps to maintain a suitable temperature, or buffers the temperature changes around my embryo. There's then the chorion for gases exchange, and then we also have the Allen toys, the Allen toys. The Allen toys that it's going to absorb or take all uh, the excretions out, and then also it is there for gases exchange. It helps with gases exchange. People 2.3 is a my hostess question, um, and what a nice illustration with regards to. to crossing over, crossing over. You can clearly see crossing over there. You can also see the homologous pairs. 
sitting next to one another and we can also then see or bivalent pairs, homologous bivalent pairs you might also call it and then we can clearly see that this is metaphase, metaphase, but what metaphase? Metaphase 1. Why is it metaphase 1? Because we still got pairs lining up on the equator and not, we don't have single chromosomes lining up on the equator, we've got pairs lining up on the equator. Identify part A, we already mentioned that this is a homologous chromosome, pair bivalent, pair homologous, pair of chromosomes. How many chromosomes are there? Uh, will there be in each cell at the end of meiosis? Let's take a look at how many chromosomes are there now. And then we can then determine because this is still not going through, uh, still hasn't gone through meiosis 1. So after meiosis 1, it's halved. Currently, ladies and gentlemen, there's 1, 2, 3, 4. And so after meiosis, there's only going to be 2. We are halving the chromosomes. We are halving the chromosomes. So 4 now, but 2 after meiosis. Then, our third question. Describe two ways in which meiosis contributes to genetic variation. The one we can see clearly over here, um, we, in prophase 1, um, it's already happened because this is pre, pre, uh, metaphase, prophase, metaphase, metaphase follows after prophase. In prophase 1, the homologous pairs they overlap one another and they exchange genetic material and we call this crossing over and we can clearly see that crossing over has happened over there and has happened over there. De then, second question there, uh, second more, uh, point there, during metaphase 1, uh, which is what we're seeing now, and in metaphase 2, what is happening is that these chromosomes can line up in a, a, any other way. So we call this typically random arrangement. Be careful of independent arrangement or independent assortment. I don't accept those anymore. It's random arrangement on the equator during metaphase 1. Metaphase 1. Okay, let's go to question 2.4. An investigation was conducted to determine the presence of metals in the river near village. The table below shows the results of four different metal readings obtained six months before, as well as the current readings in the same place. If we take a look at this, uh, reading six months before, ladies and gentlemen, 0 0.03, current reading 0 0.01, so it went down. And if we take a look at the concentration, what's the limit for freshwater life? 44. So it's far below the limit, below the limit, before and after, as well as for humans, limit for humans, it was far below. For cadmium, 0 0.02, and it went down to 0 0.01, and for both humans and freshwater life, it was below the limits, well before the time and afterwards and now. And then for lead, it went down from 2.1 to 0 0.3, so it also came down, and never was it above the limit for either freshwater life or for humans. Then for mercury, 0 0.04, um, it was 0 0.04, it went up to 0 0.23, but, but, it was never, it has, it's not now and wasn't previously above the limit for fresh water, but it is increasing, so that is a problem. We need to take a look at it because it's increasing, um, but it's not above the limit for fresh water yet, and it's definitely not above the limit for humans. So now they ask you, 
Identify the metal that has increased in concentration over the past six months. So you didn't know, need to know that before the time. You read it from the table. And the only one that increased was mercury from 0 0.04 to 0 0.23. List two strategies in which we can prevent pollution of the river with these metals. So we can increase awareness. We can make people aware of the increasing mercury or what the levels are. You can set up posters. You can have uh, public awareness um, announcements on the radio, on TV, or on certain TV programs or on the news. You can decrease the use of fertilizers. A lot of these things might be found in fertilizers and you provide people with an incentive to then um, for, to not pollute the environment you give tax benefits for example uh, um, and then you reduce industries or industrial developments especially around areas where, which are vulnerable you prevent the release of metals into the water or you can actually have penalties if people pollute the environment then question 4.3 2.4.3 Explain why the current concentration of lead may be harmful to humans even though it is below the limit for humans because of accumulation in the higher levels. Accumulation, accumulation. Now accumulation, ladies and gentlemen, comes up uh, or happens when, uh, let me show you. Uh, let me just get to the other notes here. So uh, my notes page. Okay, so let's say there is a little bit of mercury in this fish over here. So it's got some mercury inside it. And this one's got a little bit of mercury. That one's got a little bit of mercury. That one's got a little bit of mercury. And I'm very fond of fish and I eat fish. So that's me. And I'm going to eat some fish. So if I eat that one, whoop, okay, now the mercury is inside of me. I eat that one, now the mercury is inside of me. And I eat that one, now the mercury is inside of me. And I eat that one, now the mercury is inside of me. And it stays inside of me. So that's called accumulation in higher trophic levels. So because there's a little mercury in each one of these fish, there's going to be a lot of mercury inside of me if I eat all of those fish. Um, and so it accumulates uh, above the, the limit for humans. If we then eat a lot of fish same happens with some natural things that we natural substances that we find inside of fish like iodine if we eat too much fish we might have too much iodine in our blood okay let's go back to our paper Okay, so question 2.5, people. The photograph shown below was taken while a person was walking along the road and then unexpectedly chased by a hippopotamus. Just imagine, people, just imagine. And I can already feel the adrenaline rushing in my, in my veins just because of seeing this picture. Study the photograph and answer the questions below. Name the hormone that is released by the person in dealing with the dangerous situation experience that your flight or fight hormone i just mentioned in a moment ago it is adrenaline that is being secreted state where in the body the hormone mentioned in question 2.5.1 is produced and how it reaches various parts of the body so it's produced by the adrenal glands and it's an endocrine gland so it releases its substance into the blood adrenaline is released into the blood and then carries via the blood into the uh, to the different cells of the body which part of the autonomic nervous system um, increases the heartbeat uh, in this dangerous um, situation it's the sympathetic sympathetic nervous system Describe the role of the liver during dangerous situations. So it's going to convert glycogen into glucose. Let me just change my page here quickly. Then I'm going to discuss that with you. So it will change glycogen. 
glycogen. Please don't confuse that word with glucagon. Glycogen, it's activated by glucagon to do this, but it changes glycogen into glucose. We store glucose as glycogen, but now I'm going to convert it back to glucose because I need it for the extra energy because of the extra energy I needed and the respiration that then has to happen. So it converts glycogen into glucose, which is released into the bloodstream to be used as a source of energy for respiration. So I have extra energy to be able to run very fast away from that um, hippopotamus. Okay, last question under question 2.6. Last question we are going to do for today as well is human activities have an impact on the environment in many ways. Then it says in 2.6.1, alien plants are species that are introduced into an area in which, com uh, which they compete with the natural plants in the area. They out normally outcompete them because they have no natural predators where they're introduced into the new environment. Explain one advantage and one disadvantage of using a biological control to regulate population of alien plants. Plant, uh, alien plants. So I say to you that when you, when you take a plant from where it was previously, if you take a plant from where it was previously and it had a natural predator, like for example uh, over here it had a natural predator in its normal environment now you're taking it out of its normal environment and you are then putting it into an environment where it's it is now thriving it doesn't have the natural predator the natural predator never came with and now it's thriving, it's out competing the, uh, the other plants in the area. Let me just have my other plant in the area. There's another plant. There we go. And now it out competes that plant. Now we use a biological control. So what do we do with a biological control? With a biological control, we take the natural predator of that plant and we introduce it into the environment. And the advantage of this is I'm, I'm not using chemicals, I'm not harming um, other natural insects that's in the environment, I'm not causing pollution to the environment. But if this little bug becomes very successful, it's got to be species specific because if it becomes too successful, it's now going to eat the natural vegetation. And this has happened in a lot of uh, places around the world. Uh, they, for example, introduced frogs into Australia to control certain bug species that were um, introduced and they thought it's going to be a good biological control. But now they've got a frog problem because the frogs were so successful at eating not just the bugs that they were supposed to eat, but also now new bugs that currently in the uh, that was in the environment before. Then, question 2.0. 6.2. Besides recycling, state two other ways in which we can manage solid waste. Okay, so I can reduce, reuse, and uh, they said don't, uh, besides recycling. So that's your three R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle. So reuse and recycle is the other two ways in which we can reduce solid waste. Okay, great 12s. Um, use this time during the uh, long weekend to catch up for those of you that haven't been keeping up with, the, uh, with everything you had to do during the lockdown period. Catch up as far as possible because we need to continue with the curriculum so that we can do proper revision before your exams start. Thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend. I will see you guys or I'll post another video with you guys for you guys on Wednesday.